this week on Vaticano, travel to Quito, Ecuador, where the 53rd International Eucharistic Congress has just concluded, and discover stories of faith. Hear from a Benedictine monk living in Jerusalem and learn about the ongoing situation in the Holy Land. And get a behind the scenes look at two new films being produced about the lives of St. Francis of Assisi and St. Padre Pio. Vaticano starts now. On September the 13th, the Ratzinger Schulerkreis met in Rome for a theological conference. The title of the event was Holiness as the Goal of Theology and Life and took place in the auditorium of the Instituto Maria Bambina, not far from St. Peter's Basilica. The Schulerkreis, the historical circle of students, is a community of former students of Joseph Ratzinger, the late Pope Benedict XVI, and has existed since 1977. Since 2008, it has been supplemented by the so-called New Circle of Students, which brings together younger theologians who are dedicated to researching the works of Benedict XVI. Biden is yet what both circles of students have in common in their collaborative work is to make the theology of Joseph Ratzinger and Pope Benedict known, to open it up, and to bring it into debate. EWTN broadcasts the conference live. The main focus was on the general vocation to holiness and how Pope Benedict's theological legacy can contribute to deepening this vocation. Speakers included Cardinal Kurt Koch, and also Archbishop Rino Fisichella, who is pro-prefect of the Dicastery for Evangelization and organizer of the Holy Year 2025. Which photo? would you like for our sons, for our children? This is the question that society and the church together are called to answer. The Embassy of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta to the Holy See hosted a high-level event in Rome, focusing on the papal encyclical Laudato Si and the current state of renewable energy. Ambassador Antonio Zanardi Landi of the embassy invited representatives from the economic, political, and religious sectors to discuss the ongoing transition in energy sources. Italy's Minister of the Interior highlighted the critical importance of the issue for the present and future of society. Father Enzo Fortunato, spokesperson for St. Peter's Basilica, represented the church, emphasizing that the protection of creation is a key priority for the Holy Father. I think with the Laudato Si, we uh, have the 11th commandment. Don't waste is very important for our society, for uh, our sons, uh, for the future. The event, titled In the Spirit of Laudato Si, towards COP29, Energy Transition as an Opportunity for Social and Employment Inclusion, presented a study based on insights from 1,700 respondents across 10 countries. The findings emphasized the need to reskill the workforce and train engineers with a more humanistic approach to effectively lead the energy transition. Welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. In his message for Diocesan World Youth Day, Pope Francis urged young people to follow Blessed Carlo Acutis in prioritizing the great gift of the Eucharist. He highlighted how Carlo made daily prayer before the Eucharist his most important appointment. And he drew strength from his faith during this journey. The next Diocesan World Youth Day will be celebrated on November the 24th, which is also the Solemnity of Christ the King in Catholic dioceses worldwide. 
Exiled Nicaraguan Bishop Rolando Alvarez is slated to be among the participants in the second and last session of the Synod on Synodality set to take place at the Vatican next month from October the 2nd to the 27th. The Bishop of Matagalpa, known for his defense of human rights and also his harsh criticism of the Nicaraguan dictatorship, went into exile in Rome on January the 14th. Pope Francis definitively ruled out the possibility of visiting France for the reopening of the Notre Dame Cathedral. French President Emmanuel Macron invited Pope Francis to visit Paris for the long-awaited reopening of the historic cathedral, which is set to take place on December the 8th, the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. In 2019, Notre Dame was damaged by a fire that devastated the 315-foot-tall oak spire and timber roof of the 8th century old cathedral. Pope Francis will visit Luxembourg and Belgium next week for a one-day stopover in Luxembourg on September the 26th before visiting three cities in neighboring Belgium to mark the 600th anniversary of the Catholic universities of Leuven and leuven la neuve The Holy Father will preside over a Sunday Mass in Brussels on September the 29th before heading back here to Rome. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. In Rome, Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll be back with stories of faith from the International Eucharistic Congress in Quito, Ecuador. As the International Eucharistic Congress concluded in Quito, Ecuador on Sunday, September the 15th, Vatican officials announced that the next International Congress will take place in Sydney, Australia in 2028. Let's take a look back at our time in Quito, Ecuador, where the 53rd International Eucharistic Congress was held. One street, seven churches, and seven crosses. On Garcia Moreno Street, in the center of the city, it's easy to feel the authenticity of Quito. It's right here that the long Catholic history of Ecuador's capital city can be found. In the 16th century, this street was called De las Siete Cruces, Seven Crosses, because the Catholic convents and churches that lined it built several stone crosses over the years that served as popular altars during the Corpus Christi celebrations. The Bishop uh, of Quito, back in, uh, in the colonial times, he wanted to, that every church will have a, a cross of, of stone for representing this sign of, of Jesus Christ, of the death of Jesus Christ, and that he loves us. So it's, um, I think it's also the way of love, like passing through these beautiful churches. The tour of the seven colonial crosses begins at the Church of Santa Barbara and continues south through the monastery of the Limpia Concepcion until the Metropolitan Cathedral. Consecrated in 1572, the cathedral has two main entrances and holds a large part of this city's history. The important thing about this church is not only the structure that you can see, which is a real monumental structure, but it is the power of God that it represents for the people, for the religion, for the faithful. This cathedral represents the divine power that is present here in this country. Another church full of history and significance is the Basilica del Voto Nacional, or the National Vow, the largest neo-Gothic basilica in the Americas. It was built to serve as a perpetual reminder of the consecration of the Republic of Ecuador to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. 150 years ago, the decree for the consecration was signed by Garcia Moreno, to whom the city's most important street is dedicated today. 2024 marks this important anniversary and is one of the reasons Ecuador was chosen to host the International Eucharistic Congress. This is a historical moment and we need more than ever to strengthen our faith, especially in the love for the Eucharist. Here I want to give an example, Carlo Acutis, who is a wonderful Italian guy, who said that the best highway to get to heaven is the Eucharist and that the Eucharist is the one that has to ignite us now. We have to know how to grasp it in these days of the Congress. I think that the Congress has to give us a special and specific grace 
and that is the ardent love for the Eucharist through Christ. La Eucaristía a través de Cristo. More than 40 delegations from around the world have reached Quito for this Eucharistic Congress. The first city in the world to be declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site with 85% of the population baptized, Quito remains a place of faith and prayer. From Panecillo Hill along the road of seven churches, this city still believes in the saving power of the Eucharist. On the occasion of the International Eucharistic Congress in Quito, the Statue of the Virgin has become even more a place of pilgrimage and hope, especially for the citizens of Ecuador, who see this event as an opportunity to foster faith. 41 meters tall, an estimated weight of 124,000 kilos of aluminum, the Panecillo Virgin statue stands guard over the city of Quito at 3,000 meters high. It's unique as a statue of the Blessed Mother as it depicts her with the wings of an angel. As an Ecuadorian, we are very proud to be represented by this type of monument, since within the city almost 70% of people are Catholic. So being such an ancient center of South America and having the oldest churches and monuments in the world, having the Virgin of Quito, the winged Virgin for us, is something that enhances the value of the Catholic Church in Ecuador. And especially now that it has become a very important point for the visit of the Catholic Congress. History, tradition and faith are bound together in this unique place in the Quito sky. As conflict continues to grip the Holy Land, Father Nicodemus Schnabel, abbot of the Abbey of Dormition in Jerusalem, remains committed to serving his community amidst the turmoil. In this interview, he speaks with Andreas Thonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief, about the Benedictine vow of stability and his refusal to abandon his monastery despite the risks. Father Nicodemus also extends an invitation to pilgrims, encouraging them to return and support the community during this challenging time. You're responsible for the Dormitio Abbey in the center of Jerusalem, but you have come here to Rome right now for a Congress of Abbots uh, for the Benedictine community. What are you telling your brothers? What are you bringing back from the Holy Land right now? We have um, monasteries in big cities. We have monasteries in rural areas. We have very big communities, very small communities. So it's very interesting, and of course, uh, the, my colleagues, uh, abbots, ask me what about the situation in the Holy Land, of course. The speciality of all Benedictines, what it's really unique for us, it's the stability. So you also say a yes to this specific place. And so that's what we feel now with my uh, brothers and our two monasteries. We have the Domitian Abbey in Mount Zion in Jerusalem and Tapka Priory at the seashore of Galilee. It's really to say, again a second yes to our vocation. Do you regret this now in this situation to have said yes to this location? Not at all, quite the opposite. Uh, really because it's like now it's the time, you know you have to imagine, so I'm a German citizen. My government uh, told me and also my other brothers, please leave the country. It's not secure anymore. So actively I said no. I stay, I belong to this country. I made a voluntarily decision, I want to be a monk in Jerusalem and Tapka in the Holy Land for the whole lifetime. And this is now, you know, it's a feeling maybe, you know, that there are certain moments in life you have to say like a second yes. And like a second, that's my way. Every single brother of my community as well as, as, uh, as myself. We made a clear stance. We belong to this country. We belong to our monasteries. We are with the people who we feel a responsible uh, responsibility for. And could you describe the situation a little bit? It's, 
The best word to describe, it's like an ocean of suffering. I hear every day uh, with my Jewish, with my Muslim, with my Christian friends, stories of suffering, of despair, of, yes, yes, really, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's really, that's, that's a feeling. And now it's, again, how should I react on that? Uh, and our answer was very clear. First of all, we stay, and we stay open. Our both churches was never closed. They were always open. Our cafeteria was open, our shop. We were there. As the monks, we were there. Faithfully, we prayed our daily prayer from the morning till the evening, we were there. That's the very first thing to say, yes, we are here. If you need us, we are here, you're welcome. And then it was also very clear, nobody needs a statement from us. Nobody needs like, a, what is your stance on this? No, no. I remember you asking when the conflict started, uh, that you said, no, actually you don't want to, 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 to speak about this right now, but you want to be there. Exactly, exactly. And then on 17th of October, this was a very important day for me and also for our students. We have a, a, a program for German-speaking theology students. And we as the monastic community, we were 24 hours in our church. We called it the church under the cross, 24 hours, because we have a very wonderful uh, olive wood uh, cross uh, hanging um, above our altar. We were really looking at the cross and we prayed all 150 psalms because this was our answer, not to find words for what you have no words and not to make statements, but to really trust in this treasure of prayer. What we as Benedictines pray from the morning till the evening, but what also the other monks praying, the Coptic, the Ethiopian, the Syriac, the Greeks, you know, the Armenians were all in our city. Also the Jews are praying Psalms from the morning till the evening, and the Muslims have the tradition of Quran recitation. So in fact, really to trust your holy scriptures and especially the Psalms were really the fundament of our spiritual life. And this was really a big sign to say, yes, we're here and we trust our vocation. I assume there are not many pilgrims right now in the Holy Land. This is very euphemistic to say not many would say it's really we are, we are close to zero and this is uh, almost one year and this is, yeah, what you point out is that this is uh, a big burden, it's a big financial burden for me because I have 30 um, employ, uh, employees, uh, 24 locals, uh, most of them are Christians also Jews and Muslims, but the big, big, big majority are Christians, and especially in Jerusalem, Christians from Bethlehem, the, from the West Bank, Palestinian Christians. And uh, I have so many employees because they wow, why you have so, so, so big staff? That's the reason, because I have two pilgrim places. So Tapka, it's a place uh, of the multiplication of bread and fish. So uh, with the wonderful mosaic, many people know it from, from Bibles, others with the uh, uh, mosaic, with the basket, uh, with the bread and the two fish. That's my monastery uh, in Tapka. And in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, it's a place of the Assumption of Mary, Domitian, and, and, and uh, the other word for that, and of Pentecost and the Last Supper. So you can say if you are on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, for sure you were at our two monasteries. So on very, very good days, in good time, we receive 5,000 pilgrims. 5,000 pilgrims. 5,000 pilgrims a day. And for all that, I have so many uh, uh, people uh, as staff because that the pilgrims have a good time. It's difficult, really difficult, because it's almost a year. I have not much energy left. It's really, it's difficult. But I think this is also part of my vocation, to say really, because we speak a lot about solidarity as a Christian. Now it's not theoretical, now it's for me practical. Is there any end in sight to the violence in the, in the Holy Land where you say, then it will be possible for pilgrims to return? For pilgrims, I, I could really say, and, and I'm not joking, I'm, I, I'm very serious, come, come now, you can come. There are flights, also my, my monastery, we can stay with our monasteries. We have really rooms free because there are not other many guests. And so I could really say, come, 
come. We'll be back after a short break, going behind the scenes for new films on St. Francis of Assisi and St. Padre Pio. Italy is not only known worldwide for its pizza, pasta, and good wine, Italy has also produced numerous personalities who have changed the world, including many saints. Two of the most famous saints from Italy are Saint Francis of Assisi and Saint Padre Pio. A dedicated film team from Rome wants to help bring these two men to life on the big screen. Azione. My name is Daniela Gurrieri. I am a producer and director together with my husband Fabio of Cristiana Video. And we are based in Rome, but here today we're in Nepi, where we are filming a scene of a new docudrama on St. Francis and the Eucharist. The production team of Cristiana Video has already worked with EWTN in the past on a production about the life of the soon to be canonized Italian Pier Giorgio Frassati. In addition to documentaries, the team also produces movies. For me, success is when at least one person can say, ah, I understand now, I'm going to change it, I get it, that's what success is. When someone says, see, you help me think differently, maybe even change. Francesco? Francesco. San Francesco, sì. è un piacere. Ciao <laughs> Stefano. Mi chiamo Stefano Sciaranga e sono Francis, San Francis, in questo movie. One more toast. One more toast. To what? To what, Francis? You're ready to do everything and everyone. Yes. Hey, to friendship and to having fun. Saint Francis is a man who has made his decisions based on the experiences he has had. He was not born a saint, he became a saint. The actor is convinced that anyone can be like Saint Francis. Anyone can become a saint. This is the key message of the productions from Christiana Video. We think it's uh, um, efficacious to see uh, the, the, the life filmed uh, scenes of these saints, but also to listen to experts uh, who really can help you enter in depth in the meaning of what you of what you see. So it's uh, the, the this is why we chose together with EWTN to to um, to present uh, a docudrama on these aspects. This is also the goal of the new film about Padre Pio which Christiana Video is making in cooperation with the St. Pio Foundation and EWTN. Andrea Dugoni, who plays Padre Pio, sees this holy man as a role model. I pondered about sufferings and uh, what was for him sufferings towards mankind, you say, or towards people, you know, suffering people. And uh, I thought that I just, I just asked myself questions about that, and I don't think that there could be any, any real answer. There only, there only could, can be some, you know, maybe good questions or questions that lead you to reflections, you know, stuff like that. Another actor who plays in the movie about Padre Pio is also grateful for this opportunity. I'm not Catholic, I'm not, a, I was raised atheist, um, so I never really went to church, but I really find it interesting how, uh, well, certain people have such great impacts on the lives of so many other people, and especially when it's a man who grew up in rural Puglia, 
uh, and uh, still lived there uh, doing the same things he'd been doing for years and helping people at the age he was in, at the time we were shooting our scenes at least. I enjoy the fact that uh, yes he is a rather important person and I'm amazed by the fact that uh, a, a channel from America comes over here, here to Italy to do something like this is really really cool and uh, really interesting yeah. His body and blood, Franciscan Saints on the Eucharist, the film about St. Francis, will premiere on EWTN in early 2025. The film about Padre Pio will premiere on EWTN's free video-on-demand site on September the 23rd. Its title is St. Pio of Pietrocina, Man of Hope and Healing. My wish is that uh, this docudrama, like for, like happened for the others, that they may uh, reach the hearts of the people uh, to the point that they really uh, change, may change their life.